of stuff, so. Brad was hoping he could join us. It's his anniversary tonight. Oh, that's good. And so, uh, wow. Wow. So then are you at the Xbox with him, or? I am, okay. yeah. Yeah. And then Douglas will also be here. Douglas and I sort of started this meetup group. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. It's so excited. Thanks for coming out. Absolutely. Life's good. We're, you know, we're in the middle of the crowdfunding campaign, so that feels a little bit exciting. I've heard of the crowdfunding crowdfunding campaigns. This is like really my first one, so I've been kind of keeping a journal. And wow, how's it, how's it coming? We're, we're, we're sitting at about 60%. Uh, yeah, after, after about a week and a half. So. That is great. Yeah. How yeah. is the total that you're We're going for 25000 Yep. So it's okay. so about just cost of 15 that's great. It's actually it's really good. Yes. Yeah. Really yeah, good. It's absolutely yeah. Awesome. And how much more time do you have? Uh, till December 4th. Oh, yeah. About another three weeks. Oh, great. But awesome. Yeah. We have some ideas. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> like I said, we were talking about a couple of weeks ago with the expanding. Then uh, yeah, oh, yeah, there. there's all these articles about how, you know, for this far, by this long. But um, you know, so far, you know, so far, so good. I, so. Awesome. Well, we can get some freedom. <laughs> Make a plug for it tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good point. Are those beers on there? They are. They're, is that we're we're the, no, it's not. I would be honored if you would have the first one. Yeah, I'd love to. You don't care for a beer? It just arrived. The freshest, <laughs> fresh haze in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take it. Right. Thank you. There you go. Let's see, are they twist off or no? Started 
specifically kind of exploring this bar technology kind of intersection. I mean, a lot of the artists that we are interested in or programming are kind of naturally exploring these things and we kind of wanted to create a specific series or platform that was potentially exploring that. But that could, I mean, within that, it's really broad. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, what that means to know that we're exploring, or, you know, really new uh, cutting edge technologies and possibilities around that, but also, you know, looking at really ubiquitous technologies and uh, looking at our relationships between all of these things, you know, so it's looking at projects that are using computer vision to web based projects, uh, immersive kind of environments, uh, you know, all, you know, all sorts of different types of things. So, yeah, yeah, and the, the, each, the guest speaker series started, we started this maybe like, maybe the fourth or fifth speaker, and that was something that, um, when we kind of, we started this meetup, we were like, what do you guys, what would be interesting to you as a community, and this was one of the people like, I'd love to do a weekly to sort of, or monthly uh, kind of talk or demonstration, and, um, so we started doing that, I'd love to, we have a pretty good, uh, almost 400 people in the meetup now, so it'd be great to, you know, just like once a year, I think, focus, do something, I don't know, engage with each other creatively in some shape or fashion, some kind of event or happening or something that could tap into like, sort of collective creativity in a little more robust way. So if you have any thoughts or ideas about that, could be fun. I'm sure it's, I mean, know each other before and both oh, no. I'm in development. I enjoy it. It's different. 
Chapman, 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 Chapman pleasure. Oh, yeah. Right, cool. Are you working here? Uh, I'm a, a resident. I don't know if that's the word here. Oh, cool. Um, no, but, uh, um, Danielle. Yeah. Is my okay. Boss. I just got yeah. here about yeah. two um, weeks ago. And she's um, she's great. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. smart oh. and. Been in our business for 20 years. years. Really? Trying to make sure that the programming is a lot more place based instead of being able to We're building really nice video apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're trying to get people uh, to the ground to the ground more and her vision and Louis' vision uh, for what was probably what the moon and glory is going to be like you know, in the next five, six, you know, uh, ten years. It's just really inspiring. inspiring. So oh, really? Ted? The energy is. Okay, where's that here? There's a workshop here on the 22nd. Like in all day, it's like it's a Sunday. It's like it's like a geek fest. It'll be like um, eight in the morning to like nine in the evening, mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Nice. Who's playing that? Uh, one of the startups here. It's called Jackrabbit. Oh, but they're doing that with the app. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe 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 that is this the confused box. It is. Yes. Cool. There's lots of pizza in here in the back. Hi, I'm Carlos. Robin, nice Robin, to meet you. How are you? It's great. Good. I heard you work at the Contemporary. Are you Carlos C? That's me. Yes. yes. <laughs> Were we supposed to be in touch for some reason? No, but I remember Caroline and Danielle had a meeting with you. Yeah. Yeah. Were you supposed to be there? No, I was not. Oh, okay. I'm not the one they set out to talk to people. Like okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, that, I, that was yesterday. Maybe. I don't know. I think that was yesterday. Oh, great. Welcome to town. I know all about you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, who's from Fusebox here? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'm the founder and marketing director. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll tell us all about it, I imagine. That's why we're here, huh? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I'm happy to tell you more afterwards. Um, yeah, I can answer as many questions as you might have. <laughs> and then, yeah, we're going to hear from this fine. But yeah, this was something we started, I don't know, maybe six months ago? Uh, for the past several years, we have been developing this art and technology series or platform. Um, and the, the, uh, Douglas, who's on our, on our board, suggested that we start the Meetup group. It's free, but you'll see who's interested, and it's, there's been a lot of people interested. Almost 400 people in the Meetup now, which is really exciting. Uh, very early on, we just sort of put it to the like, what, what are some things that would be interesting or meaningful? And the sort of speaker series some demonstrations kind of came up as something that people would be interested in learning more. In some ways, it's been kind of a way, we use the meetup as a way to start to survey what's happening here locally, who are some of the players who are doing really interesting things at this intersection of learning technology, and profiling some of those artists. Um, we're going to start to create a kind of a, a more defined network, a uh, social network between these different uh, people that are working in this in this space. Um, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, within the sort of realm of art and technology, I mean, we're exploring a whole host of uh, different things, really kind of cutting edge new technologies uh, to very ubiquitous technologies, people using cell phones projects around, um, we're looking at projects that are using computer vision, yeah, um, yeah. Um, using technology to create really immersive environments, data visualization, really a whole host of different types of projects, and we're kind of, again, mostly looking locally right now, although we're going to start bringing in some national and international speakers as well, that's something that, as a festival, we do an annual festival every year, and that's something is that the one that's coming up here? It's coming in April. Okay. Our festival's in April, yeah. So they said it's, it's separate from the East Austin tour? Yes, it is, yes. yes. Um, they're good friends, but <laughs> separate, yeah. Okay. Our festival is, it is multidisciplinary. Uh, it's all different types of art, although there's, there's often a sort of, I think at the heart of it is the live event. We do a lot of things that have a, a performative element to them. Um, but. And this is right around South by Southwest, or it's it's a it's a little after it's in April. Okay. Uh, and 
this year I think it'll be two or three weeks after South by Southwest. Um, it's all curated. It's one part local, one part national, one part international. We wanted to create a platform for local artists to have their work seen by the world. And we invite curators and writers uh, from all over. Um, uh, but we also wanted to keep injecting new ideas and new thinking by uh, bringing in artists from elsewhere. Um, and we have a, like a festival hub each night where artists and audience members all hang out together with the theaters. So really interested in creating a really tangible relationship between the work of the artists and the audiences and other artists, you know. Um, and there have there been previous editions of this? This will be our 12th. Okay. Yeah. So there have been several. Yeah, and we're real, I was just telling you, we started very small. We had a budget of like $5,000 our first year. That's what we just sort of built the festival. We never knew we'd do it twice, much less than 12 times. So, uh, now it's my job, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, a lot of my job is um, travel. I travel all over just looking for artists and projects and that sort of thing. And, as the festivals grow, we get invited to more and more places, which is nice. A lot of, certain, most of the international travel is uh, all paid for by like cultural ministries. Um, they have money to export their country's artists, and so, um, it's a novel concept. <laughs> And the festival takes place all over the city at like 20 or 25 different locations. We do things in galleries and museums and theaters, uh, but we also do a fair amount of stuff in sort of untraditional spaces as well. We've done things underneath bridges and in alleyways, little neighborhoods look on sites for, for uh, events and projects. It's sort of like that, of using the festival as a tool to explore a place. Uh, most of the, the work is very uh, contemporary, it's very fresh, it's of the moment. Um, they'll do a lot of sort of like still life painting. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Was it last year that you guys did uh, the free tick thing? Yeah, we've done it for two years. Oh, okay. and this is our third year yeah. doing it. We, and we sort of set it up as like a three year experiment. Okay. Yeah. It's been doing great, yeah, yeah. So we started a campaign two years ago called Free Range Art, which was an initiative to make the entire festival free to attend. Uh, we wanted to have a bigger conversation about access, who has access to this work, but we also wanted to have a conversation about the economics of making this work. But we were really clear to state that just because it's free to get into doesn't mean that it was free to make, that it actually cost quite a bit. And we felt like, at least at our old model, that. Uh, ticket sales were actually kind of obscuring what was going on, and people felt like they were paying for this thing and they weren't even beginning to pay for it. So we just wanted to separate these things out and be like, here's this work that we really believe in. We think everyone should have access to it, but let's also talk about the, the actual cost of making this work. It's not free, it's not the 10 or 12 bucks we usually charge to get in. So how do we as a community want to pay for it? Um, and so the first two years of doing this, we've had a 60% increase in first time festival goers. So we've been inviting a lot of new people in. Uh, on average, people were going to twice as many things, which is really exciting because to me, like a festival is not going to see one thing. It's actually this kind of uh, encountering multiple ideas and seeing this, this, and this, and you like, start to get this kind of wonderful collision of perspectives and ideas. So we wanted to encourage that. Uh, and that seemed to be working. And we raised as much money, actually more money, than if we sold out every show. So financially, it's, it's been, and we, we did a Kickstarter campaign. Um, so we'll see. We set it up as a three-year experiment. We weren't sure if there was like, you know, over time, if, if, if there was some novelty to this, that after year three, people are like, okay, I get it, but I really just want to buy my fucking ticket and get on with it, you know? So, but, you know, we'll see. Um, and I think more than anything, we kind of like the idea of just taking this kind of basic assumption about the best way, how do you go to the best way you like to get and turning that into a, a sort of provocation or a conversation about the um, I don't know, I think there's, the word free is really loaded and there's lots of value judgments about it. And does something free mean it's not any good? And, uh, that's a, I think, an interesting conversation. 
But I grew up in Houston and really loved, I just loved going to the Medeal Museum in Houston. It's one of my favorite in the world. And it was always free, and I just always thought that was such a treasure. And I never felt like that, like, cheapened what I was looking at, you know. It's a fun conversation now. I was in Houston not too long ago, and I had no idea. It's like just the number of works and the quality of works, and like the, it's just it's really fun. Yeah, it's totally unexpected. Mm. Even commercial galleries are free. Yeah, yeah. Got a few. That's right. That's free right. to love, not to touch. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you see that? <laughs> I mean, I'm, well, I'm happy to pay for tickets. I do it all the time. It's not like I'm like, no one should have ever been No, yeah, 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 of course. It's just, fine. Makes you smile. Well, it's interesting. You, you like go to New York and spend like you know your whole weekend in Chelsea on the Lower East Side and not spend it down. Yeah. yeah. Just looking at hundreds, if not thousands, of horrible things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something to consider. Like, should museums be There's different models. I mean, a lot of them have like, uh, you know, there's lots of fundraising, basically they give grants. Um, yeah, but yeah, what is a lot of like manage like endowments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like there's just entry models. fees, like, is not the most sustainable way I think to run. Yeah. Yeah. For us, tickets were such a small part of our budget. Yeah. Like, it's, it, from like actually financially, it was yeah. actually very small. I mean, yeah. you know, we're a small one. Profit be every penny, but it, it didn't feel like a huge financial risk to try this thing out. Hello. Hi. Help yourself to pizza or beer in the back if you like. Did you have like uh, sponsors? You have a few. Yeah. Uh, and it, it varies from year to year. Um, the first year we did this free range art campaign, we had uh, AT&T come on as a sponsor. Um, but generally speaking, sponsors have not been a big part of what we've done. We, um, our biggest source of funding is government. So the city of Austin, the state, and NEA. Uh, and then we get a lot of uh, foundation support. It's usually project specific. Mm -hmm. um, all of our international work comes with uh, funding from our, the artist's home country. Uh, and we have a big pool of private donors. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. And, and, some years there's more sponsorship dollars than others. I do think that at this point we could be getting more sponsorship dollars. Um, I think we've created a unique enough thing that um, if that was something we really wanted to put our energy behind, we could get some more of that. So yeah, but it's been it's been really fun to kind of. Uh, I mean, it feels like a living, breathing thing to me. It keeps evolving. We keep experimenting with it. Uh, we have a full-time staff of three, um, which is great. We need a few more, but I like the style that it allows us to be really nimble. And, uh, we can try out things. Um, we partner with about 20 different, I mean, we partner with the contemporary, we partner with multiple departments of the university, with women in the work. We partner with many organizations nationally and internationally. We're still a very small team, so the partnerships allow us to do some bigger projects that we wouldn't be able to do by ourselves, but we can still be pretty nimble and um, try things out when we want to. And how about yourself? What, uh, what Me? Were, yeah. Uh, I, I just started here at, uh, here, I, I think I took a, a note about the fuse box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fred was telling me about you guys. Uh, oh. Actually, uh, a guy who's a, a teacher at the architecture school at UT. Oh. I just started here about two, two weeks ago. At the architecture school? Oh, no, here, here oh. at oh, Captain Park. Oh, great. Awesome. Yeah. Fabulous. How's it going? Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my sticker today. <laughs> it was a banner day. Nice. Yeah. No, I'm working. Um, we're developing a platform uh, for uh, for video art, um, which uh, will go through Apple TV. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. 
awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's art and tech, and it's, yeah, I guess you would call it digital. Um, but, you know, I think, I imagine that your definition of what you guys are doing is much broader than, you know, that, right? Totally. Yeah. It, it could be yeah. lead, it could be interactive, yeah. it could totally. be sound, it could be... Yeah. And we've had all those All things. of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. It's really uh, funny. I should have. I, I, I would have known. I, I actually just published a book uh, on collecting digital and video art, um, which is something that you should probably know. Wow, about. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have to give you. I love it. Yeah. yeah. We just published that about a month, a month, a month and a half ago. Oh wow. Um, but that was mostly, you know, focused on uh, screen-based mm -hmm. moving image work, and of course, digital is a lot yeah. broader than that. So, uh, so it's, oh, oh, I love to read it. It's like an important theme in the book, of course. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we have to sort of, sort of immediately go to like the screen, but yeah, as you know, it's it's totally different. Yeah. Did you see some of the shows? Like there was the um, the uh, what was it called? The thing at the at the new museum, the last triennial in New York. Mm -hmm. It was earlier in the spring. That was really like digitally focused. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of you know. <clears throat> Call it like the post-internet show. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the kids were just doing their stuff. Oh, okay. But you know, I mean, everything sort of like had video-type components to it. Mm -hmm. But it was all sculptural. It was all installation. I mean, everything was really like, you know, quite immersive. And yep. you know, there were you know, lots of three D scanning and stuff like that. You know, lots of generative work that was, mm -hmm. you know, data-driven. Awesome. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you guys have been doing it for twelve years. Because it seems to be having a moment like now. Yeah. I mean, the, the, even like the the, the term post internet was just coined like a few years ago. Hmm. Uh, about I don't know, maybe two three years ago. And um, but you know it goes way back. It goes back to like computer art. Yeah. That's from the you know, mid '60s, right? And, and how long are you are you from Austin? Where are you? I grew up here. Awesome. I, I just moved here. Um, yeah, I, just moved, I was living in Europe actually. Oh, I was wow. in France. Okay. Yeah. yeah, my company is based in France actually, oh, wow. and we're here to sort of launch the whole U.S. Wow. Oh, cool. Yeah. When is it launch? When is it? Yeah. When? Uh, hopefully February first. Wow. Yeah. And what's it called? What's it? It's called Dad. Dad. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. I think I might even have a flyer with me. Yeah, it's called Dad. It used to be Digital Art Device because we were talking about doing hardware. Yeah. But that's like the dumbest thing we ever thought of. And then we talked to some guys here, and they were like, they were developing for Apple, and they were like, stop that hardware stuff now. Um, so yeah, now we're just focusing on the, the delivery and the content. Yeah, right. Yeah, please help yourself to eat some beer. You have like eight pieces. <laughs> you have to have it. <laughs> There are all of these other festivals going on. There's like this thing, pop. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. And of course, South by Southwest. I mean, how do you guys sort of navigate that landscape there? Yeah. I mean, there's a million festivals here. Yeah, this is like a show for that, right? Really? Yeah. Is. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, I think we, from the get-go, have really tried to, to make sure that. The work that we're presenting is, is unique and different, that it's not duplicating what what is already happening. Um, and so my, my background is more uh, actually on the performance side of things. Um, but I also just felt like uh, I didn't want to just do a performance festival. Most, so much of the work I was interested in was really hybrid and form. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and that's still the thing. There's only a, a handful of festivals like Fusebox in the whole country, and so it still feels like it's it's fulfilling a pretty unique place in the local landscape as well as the national landscape. Um, but you know, we try and schedule it. You know, it's at least a couple of weeks after South by so people have time to uh, you know nurse their hangovers. And, uh, but it's I mean the spring and the fall. It's like every weekend there's like three or four festivals and things going on. It's gotten to the point where it's, uh, unless you want to maybe do it in August or July when it's like so hot then, then um, yeah, it becomes pretty rough. Um, uh, we've kind of made part of our work in a way, this ongoing 
investigation of festival, like uh, you know, what are festivals uniquely inherently good at that maybe other platforms are not, and then more specifically, what are things that our festival can be doing that maybe a lot of these other festivals are not doing. Um, and so that's that's also been kind of woven into the DNA of. started and where we're at now. Originally, we, we wanted to, you know, it started with uh, wanting to create a, an opportunity to connect local artists with the world um, and uh, provide a, a platform for their work to be seen. Uh, in a way, that was an attempt to help uh, keep Austin artists in Austin, that you didn't have to necessarily go to LA or New York to have your work seen, that you could live here if you chose to live here because you like to live here and you could still be connected to the world. Um, but we, again, we also wanted to keep uh, injecting new thinking by bringing in artists from all over and um, providing opportunities for local artists and out-of-town artists to engage with one another. Um, sometimes by creating collaborations between them, sometimes by setting up workshops or classes, talks, these sorts of things. Um, yeah, uh, that's, and that remains at the heart of, of what we're doing. I think in, in recent years, we've also been really interested in um, how we as an arts organization can reposition ourselves to be playing a more vital role in our community and the everyday lives of Austinites. This past year, we uh, got this grant to lead a planning and imagining process for this 24-acre site in East Austin. It was one of Austin's like darkest environmental chapters. Um, yeah. It's part of the old Think East farm. or something. Yeah, like it's East. called Think East. Yeah. Um, but we felt like contained in this project were like so many of the issues facing Austin right now is it's experiencing this explosive growth. Things like you know gentrification, displacement, historic segregation. This is in a largely uh, working class Latino and African American neighborhood. How do you build a place that's new and forward-looking that simultaneously honors the history and culture that's, that surrounds it? Um, so we designed this 18-month uh, uh, planning process to imagine the future of this site uh, that kind of had two stakeholder groups, the neighborhood and the arts community. Um, halfway through that process was our festival um, this past year, and so we thought it'd be interesting to use the festival as an opportunity to model uh, the ideas that had emerged thus far, and so we created this sort of like pop-up village uh, as part of the, the festival, and invited the neighborhood and the arts community and the city out to respond to it and tell us which ideas they liked, which they didn't, threw some new ideas into the mix, uh, and the idea was then when we take all of that feedback and create a master plan uh, and a business plan for the site um, that addresses you know, ownership in new ways and affordability, um, health, arts and creativity, these sorts of things. Hey dude, Hello. how are you? Uh, product manager at Pixar. Brian, here's your counterculture. 
old person. Yes. <laughs> I'm Johnny Howell, I'm a user experience designer um, from Hyper Island in the UK, uh, studying human centered design. Awesome. Love it. Human what? Human centered design. Um, I'm Vincent Stamco, I'm just a local musician. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, you're here. Thanks. Um, Paris, uh, I'm an audio engineer and recommend. I'm Robin, I work at the Contemporary Austin and their database, database administrator, I suppose. Very small view. <laughs> Uh, I'm Carlos. I'm uh, trying to uh, put stuff on Apple TV for artists. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, this is a monthly meetup. Um, we um, do it every month here at the Capital Factory. And for the past several months, we've been inviting a guest artist, technologist to come and talk about uh, a project, or perhaps uh, it can either be a specific project, or it can be a whole sort of suite of projects, sort of uh, body of work that they talk about, and we kind of leave it up to them. Um, it's obviously super formal, um, so I hope you're ready. For that. Um, so I don't know, why don't we just launch in, and then yeah. we'll uh, there'll be some questions afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. I mentioned Fractionalis, which is a, a nonprofit that helps arts and arts organizations in all kinds of different ways. If you bought a ticket to Fusebox, you'd probably use some of the software that we've made. Uh, we also help artists get insurance and raise funds and uh, get visa letters and all kinds of things like that. Um, but uh, my wife is actually a fine artist, and she makes quilts under the name Folk Fibers. Oh, sorry. And uh, I'm going to be talking today about Make Time Clock, which is a, it's a hardware project that kind of came out of collaborating with her and her artwork. Uh, and it eventually became an official Fractured Atlas project that we're now funding on Kickstarter. Um, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it, it may be the simplest to kind of give you the quick demo uh, of how, it, how this thing actually works. Uh, and then I want to talk, have some slides to talk about some of the process that we went through, uh, some of the insights um, that have kind of formed these core ideas um, and helped us make decisions. Um, but if you have thoughts or agree or disagree or have insights, feel free to interrupt and we can, we can just talk about them as we go along. Um, and then we have, yeah, we'll have time at the end as well. Fractured Actless is, is awesome been great uh, partners with us that help develop our whole sort of ticketing and reservation system and they're really wonderful to work with. It, yeah, it, it is a great organization and, and selfishly it's the kind of organization we can have a crazy idea and get and <coughs> be encouraged to kind of follow it. So right. that, that's been huge for me. Um, but make, make Time Clock is, is this physical object. Uh, it is milled out of a solid block of walnut and it's specifically for people who want to spend more time on their side projects. So for people who have day jobs uh, and are trying to be creative on the side. Um, so you, there's six lights on the front and each light represents a 30 minute work session. So you, you buy the device, you receive it in the mail, and you put it in your work session and basically you simply clock in when you sit down. Um, by default, these will blink for 30 minutes and then it'll go solid. I have this one set to 10 seconds, so uh, you'll see. So now you've uh, checked a work session and you move on to the next one. Uh, every Monday morning, the clock resets and all the lights clear. So there's this sort of natural deadline each week that, that you have. Um, we also have, uh, there's a companion app for the phone and what that does is visualize uh, the, the work sessions that you're tracking uh, and kind of help you find your creative rhythm and when you are more productive and when you are more inspired. Um, we also, with the app, send notifications. Um, so this says, Moonlight drowns out all but the brightest stars, uh, which is a quote from Tolkien. And 
the prompt is to consider a late night work session during the full moon on Wednesday. So sort of contrasting your typical fitness app that's, you know, you're like you didn't meet your goal, our, our, our uh, intention is to cause more reflection and thought about your work and less guilt. Um, so like I said, we are on Kickstarter. Uh, I, I don't know how interesting it is, but um, I had this idea and the Kickstarter, the goal is to kind of prove that there are other people interested in enough to buy it. Um, so we've been built a variety of different prototypes over the last year and have had testers from kind of a lot of different creative disciplines, a screenwriter, a photographer, um, and had kind of refined the design. And this is sort of the next logical step. Like, do we continue to invest and like roll this out? Is, does, this, does it resonate with enough people? So that's why we chose to, to launch it on Kickstarter. Um, this is a sneak peek of some of the rewards we're going to roll out. We're, like I said, we're, we're about a week and a half into it, and it ends at the beginning of December. So the, we're going to do some one-off artist edition clocks, and Michael Owen from the Baltimore Love Project has, has custom painted a, a one-off version. Noah Scalen, who I'm familiar with because he does the Skull a Day series, um, we're sort of designing this custom CNC one. Uh, so that's going to be some, some rewards we're rolling out. Uh, we're, we're also rolling out a version that y you sort of buy a kit of two clocks, and one of them has one of them looks like this with the button, and one of them has no button, and they're synced. So it's kind of the idea that you would buy it in support of your creative friend or family member, and you'd kind of be able to, to follow in step with them uh, as they as they work through their sessions. Um, I don't think I have to make too much of a case on why side pro projects are important and because uh, I think as artists and creative people you usually are doing lots of things um, and getting paid for just a few of them. But I found this quote, um, my background is in development and this is on this guy's blog post about development side projects. Um, so I thought, I, thought, I thought it was really great and it summed it up better than I could say it. He says, side projects inspire us. They give us much needed reprieve from the daily grind of our day-to-day -day work life. They breathe new life into who we are and what we do. Side projects are often where we find true passion. They're where ingenuity and brilliance truly shines and they're responsible for, for some of the greatest products that we all know and love or maybe hate. Um, <laughs> so and I think that really resonated with me. Um, and one of the like most famous programming side project is Gmail. Uh, it just started as like a fun toy that somebody was playing around with at Google. Um, but I think backing away from that, most most products start on the side. I think most ideas uh, start while you're working on something else, um, while you have other responsibilities, and sort of you know thinking about Fusebox even hearing that story it sort of like builds up to a point that it's undeniable. Um, so I think, I think, just to say, side projects are really important, and I think they deserve uh, to be protected and to be cherished. And so that's kind of uh, one of these core ideas of the project, is that uh, by their nature, side projects are less important than the main project, but maybe there's some uh, balance there that needs to happen. Um, this, this, this other idea of uh, consumption versus creation, I think, is it plays a lot into the project. Um, especially, I think, in technology, we're talking about Apple TV. Uh, the the amount of resources and money that goes into developing new products, typically, again, generalizing here, but typically, it's more to help to help us consume. Um, if you think about like the Netflix and uh, you know the HBO and we, we, can all, we can get all this content so easily, so quickly, and, there, and there's lots of money put into it. And I was thinking today, I think the reason that it's so easy and the reason we've made that so easy is because that's where the money is made, uh, li licensing this content and controlling access. So I think it makes sense as to why it is the focus, but again, creativity I think deserves, like 
a, a more balanced investment. And so that's, that's also uh, one of the things that excites me about this project is using technology to help people create more. Um, my grandmother, uh, we used to visit my grandmother every year in Louisiana and her house was like filled with these paintings and literally like no more paintings could fit on the walls. And I didn't realize, but after a few years, I, um, my mom told me that she, the, my grandmother had actually done all these paintings. These were, this was her own work on her wall. And I think so often with creative work, it's judged on the output and the final product, whether that's the final edit of a video, the final mix of the song, um, the final painting on the wall. But for her and for most of the artists I know, it's the, the final artifact is actually secondary. And she literally had no use for more paintings, but she wanted to paint. And she didn't want to like live with paintings, she wanted to just be a creative person and spend her time doing that. Um, and I think that's, again, one of these core ideas of how can we help people live these lives of creativity and focus on that, that process and less of, well, how well did your album sell or how many tickets did you sell to the show? Um, just being in that creative flow uh, it is valuable in itself. And talking about flow, um, uh, you guys are probably familiar. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is how I was taught to say his name. He has that great book on flow, and the, the idea of flow is the uh, you get so immersed in this activity that you kind of lose all track of time, and you're just totally engulfed. And it's this great idea, but he also has this follow-up book, Creativity, that I also highly recommend. Um, and he tracks creative work over a lifetime and how, how creators change and their rhythm changes. And he also has some tips on how to improve creativity in your own life. And uh, one of the things he, he talks about that really stuck with me is this idea of entropy and that uh, by its nature, creativity will, uh, will, what does he say? So our other, the other concerns of our life will overtake it. Like these modern lives we live are, are full of concerns and responsibilities and things we have to do. And that naturally eats away at our creative time. Um, because creativity is reflective and it sort of forces you to take a break from your work. Um, so one of the ideas of the clock that's sort of embedded in this clock is that you protect your time by becoming aware of it. And so this clock sitting out on your desk becomes an aware, almost just more of an awareness that like each time you walk past it or each time your roommate sees it and can see how far you've gotten, um, you're reminded about this, this thing that's so important to you that's so easily overtaken by everything else. Um, one of the other things that stuck with me, I, I went to art school we were talking about and I got to this rhythm of starting a class, working on a project, getting a critique, and like going on spring break and partying, and then like sort of starting over on a new project in a new class. And I know for me, coming out of that into the real world and at a job was just so jarring because projects don't end. And like you very rarely have a satisfying critique. And there's always like more work to do and the next one has already started before anything else is wrapped up. And I think for creators, uh, just a little bit of structure. So this idea of this sort of like weekly rhythm and tempo, um, I think can, can have a powerful impact that we don't naturally have, especially for side projects, because typically there, there are no stakeholders. There's nobody who's waiting for, the, waiting for you to deliver and the deadlines you've sort of made up. And so again, these are things, sort of things where we're by buying this device and incorporating it in your life. Uh, you're sort of get, getting um, experience design. I'm glad that you said that because uh, going to school and using words like you know designing experiences and changing people's behavior with products, are, I think are things that I 
naturally say and believe, but having talked about this idea with lots of artists, I think people are taken aback. Um, and it's caused me to kind of reevaluate as someone who's making products and putting them out in the world, can, we, can you really change behavior? Like how much effect do you really have on the, the user of your device? And thinking about that, I, I had bought this, this manual coffee grinder or you feed the beans in the top and grind it. And mostly bought it because the electric ones are so terrible sounding, especially in the morning. Um, <laughs> so this one, you, have, you manually crank it. And it's been interesting, we've had it for a couple of years, but it's become this, this daily ritual for me, for my wife. And when we have like a couple of friends stay over, we, we end up in the mornings around the table, sort of like taking turns grinding. This is not fast. And it takes about a minute to get one cup of coffee. So uh, it's become, it's this artifact, this, this thing has really changed our behavior and, and added this new element to our life. Um, and I, I have a little six month, 16 month year old daughter who's like, every morning she's like fascinated by this thing that she sees every day. But you know, she's like trying to stick toys in it. And, uh, but I think we, We products can can have an impact on you, and I think sometimes that's hard to hear. And I think a, another way to rephrase that is that the we whatever we value, we tend to surround ourselves. We spend our money on the things that we value. So, and it, like I value uh, not having a crazy noise in the morning, or like having a peaceful start to my morning. So I buy products that do that. So it, it sort of flips it rather than saying like this product makes me who I am, sort of like I am who I am, and these products are, are appealing to me because of that. Um, so that gave me some, some kind of peace in that, and trying, feeling like I was overstepping my bounds as a, as a product designer. Um, another thing in the product development cycle is iteration, is, is a word we use a lot. Um, and this project, especially, uh, was like that in that we didn't we didn't really know what we were building at the beginning, and so we start with lots of ideas and sketches, and sort of like pick the most compelling one and move it a little bit further into reality. So you can kind of like think of this as a funnel. And the first version of this was just a cardboard box with a little toggle switch and a timer. And my wife was making quilts and she'd flip the switch and the timer would start counting. Um, and then the next version was like, well, that's a little bit manic. It's like there's a bomb sitting, <laughs> sitting on her desk, counting, you know, these numbers running. So then we started playing around with it, using these lights and being a little bit more abstract in how uh, we show the passage of time. And although, although this is showing, a, like, if you imagine the final product at the bottom, I think the cool thing about product design, and I think most creative work, is that you can move up and down through the levels as you go. So you may get down and realize, uh, something's not right, or I, you know, I gave it to, to uh, a writer, and uh, she, um, like, she didn't understand why that why were there ten lights on it, and so you can kind of like jump back up and forth through these levels, and I think there's something to be learned at each one, and in the same way that you can um, you can view a sketch and sort of fill in the details. You know, maybe like video games are a good example because we have photorealistic video games, these first-person shooting games that look look like photographs, but then you'll play an iPhone game that are just these big shapes. And I think as humans, we're really good about filling in those blanks. And so that's what's been fun about this project too, is that even like the crudest of models or the crudest of sketches, you can start to learn things. Um, so this is kind of a, oh, I did it. I knew it was going to. I knew it was going to happen. Uh, it's a party. Sorry. Thanks. Probably shouldn't put a beer on a slanted surface. Lesson learned. I'll clean it up. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah. Um, so when we started handing out these prototypes, 
We were collecting data on when people were clocking in, how often they were using it, what times of the day they were using it. And we had all this, this data and quantitative numbers that we could track and plot over time. But I think the, the more interesting thing for me is how people felt uh, using something like this and the, the qualitative and the feelings behind it. So what we did in this instance was we set up a phone number and we would actually text our testers, people with devices, and we, we had little prompts and we, we did it actually in the voice of the clock. So we would say like, as the clock, hey, like, how are you feeling about me? Like in the first person of the clock. And uh, it was interesting, and one, of the, one of the first things that came out, oops, was uh, it's too bright. It was like, I got a text, it was like, you're too damn bright, I, I'm trying to sleep and the lights are too bright. It's like, oh, okay, that's, that's good advice that, that we didn't have just based on the numbers that we were doing. Um, Another article that influenced the work, uh, it was actually a research report, and the, the title said that more effort, putting more effort into a project makes you more passionate about it. And they kind of summed up, I think it was actually based on business people and business ideas, but they summed up that we, we often say like follow your passion, but th this sort of puts a new twist on it that the passion follows you the passion will follow your work, um, which I, I think is powerful because anyone who's, who's created something new or took on a new challenge, as you get deeper, you there's some new twist, you learn some new technique that is sort of like you uncover that isn't things that aren't immediately obvious. Uh, and the more you get into it, the more excited you get about it. And th that again goes to this idea that just, just like getting started and, and working regularly, you're going to uncover your interest in something in, in the work. Um, so designing, so <clears throat> well, in product design, we have this idea of personas, and it's kind of a, an archetype of the person that you're designing for, and I had recently read this book, uh, Anne Truitt Daybook, which is a cool book that I recommend. It's essentially just a journal. She's a sculpture artist, um, sort of in the mid 70s, working in a couple residencies, making a couple of shows. She kind of just kept this log of, of her work and what she was thinking about. And it helped me kind of get into the mind uh, of an artist. And some of those qualities, um, you know, artists are passionate, um, they're vulnerable, um, they're emotional, um, and ha I think having these, having this idea of this iconic person may come off as a stereotype, and sometimes it can feel that way, but the, I think the real, the power, the power of having, using that model and, I, and personifying um, your audience allows them to sort of have a seat as you're working on a product. So it's not just like how would I want this thing to look. This you also have this other entity with a with its own personality that can um, speak up for itself. And that was really helpful. Oh yeah. But it is it, this is a personal project for me, like I said. Um, I went to art school and most of my good friends are friends that I met at school, and it's been interesting to watch their careers develop over the last kind of decade. And some have had success as fine artists, but the majority haven't. And some have gone into creative careers, but some of them haven't. And I think kind of reconnecting with them around these ideas was really helpful to see that uh, they, they, this is like a shared need, I think, to to create and to express yourself. Um, and like I said, my you know my wife being around my wife every day and working we're both working from home uh, was was really helpful for me. Um, quality. So another core idea is. 
quality. This is supposed to be like a micrometer that can like measure small distances. And when I think of quality, I think about like tolerances and you know like your BMW door tolerance is so much thinner than like you know your Ford F one hundred and fifty is fat and um, you know the, how durable is the material how. Uh, how long does the finish hold up against wear? Um, but the other idea for quality in, in this project especially was um, being respectful of the, of the artist and the artist's time. Um, and by, even with our testers, I'm asking them to sort of open up their their sort of sacred space and where they where they are the most vulnerable and to put this electronic device in that space and like it can't like crash um, like they have so limited time for this work like it can't just stop working and it can't flake out and that, that happened and it was frustrating for me but I think it really raised the bar for what we're doing to kind of take on that responsibility of uh, someone al allowing us um, to be a part of their creative process and kind of living up to that standard. Um, and thinking about personality of the device, um, we I think we're all pretty familiar with personifying objects and we name our cars and all that kind of thing. Uh, but I was reading John Kolka, who runs the Austin Center for Design, um, in his last book, he has this idea that not only do we uh, give intangible objects personality, but by actually using them, we take on those characteristics. So if you're working in a database application that's really frustrating and keeps crashing or time out, like you, you became a, become as frantic as that um, which I thought was really interesting and kind of influenced me to think about what are what qualities do we want our user to take on and and for me that was kind of like I said reflection and being more thoughtful and so we kind of came up with this idea of the creative sensei and instead of um, like a fitness coach with a whistle who's like make sure you rock, walk your you know 10,000 mile, 10,000 steps every day. Um, it becomes uh, a much more meditative personality who's much softer in the way they approach you um, and doesn't necessarily tell you what to do, but sort of provokes thoughts on your own. Um, and so that, oh yeah, so that's sort of ident uh, right here represented by kind of a walking stick. Uh, and so think about like a walking stick. It doesn't give you directions. It's not like, it's not counting your calories on your walk. It's not telling you you missed your turn. It's just sort of like supporting you on your journey. And for me, that's a really helpful metaphor uh, when I think about building a device for creative people on their projects. It's like, I want to support them. I don't need to tell them where to go. I don't need to, to like blow a whistle and run behind them. Like that's, that's the part they're already doing. Um, this idea that uh, creative ha creativity often happens privately um, and in our personal studios and in our personal time and um, it's not often that you see examples of people being creative. I, I remember like the first season of Project Runway I was like so excited because you sort of got this glimpse. Uh, I'm sure I'm not a fashion designer but I felt like I got some glimpse in how some of those things came to life. Um, but for the most part, if you're not in a class uh, or, or your job doesn't explicitly require it, you're not creating in front of people and creating immediate feedback. And that sort of translated to this device to give you an external, uh, almost like a monument to your work. And although it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily display exactly what you're working on, it gives other people a sense of your progress and your effort and it sort of spawns, can spawn conversations from it. Um, one of our testers said she felt like her roommates would, would treat her a little bit differently based on how much time she had tracked and 
you know, like they, they didn't ask me out to dinner because they could see that I was like, had only worked once that week and I was trying to stay in. Or maybe they'll bring dinner to me to be more helpful. Um, so I think it's a very subtle, simple thing, but I think it can have big ramifications by being public about your, your creative side project and getting support from other people. Um, we also identified this idea of crossroads and these times when people stop and evaluate what they're spending their time on. Um, for one of our testers, she had just got a promotion and that spawned her to actually enroll in improv classes. And I was like, oh, okay, tell me about it. And, it, and she was like, well, you know, I, ha I have more money. I'm like trying to figure out my work schedule and thinking about like, what am I gonna, do? like this caused me to think about well, what's my next promotion. And for her, she evaluated everything and, and realized she wanted to be more creative. And, and just the act of getting this promotion um, really spawned this, this new growth in her. And there's the stereotypical ones around New Year's or graduation. Um, you know, for my wife and I, when we had the, our baby, sort of is a chance to reevaluate every, every responsibility you have. And so we've been thinking about how we can sort of help people through some of those transitions. So that's kind of what I have, uh, but happy to talk more about any of those things or anything else. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Some yeah, please. I mean, I, first of all, I have to start with side projects because yeah. like, side pro I share a love of side projects. I feel like they are uh, for myself personally, but also I feel like so many of uh, the, the art projects and performances and things that I end up loving have started off as side projects. And so I'm a big believer in feeding side projects and supporting them. I think there's something kind of... Uh, um, I feel like almost inherent in the idea of a side project is this is a certain freedom. Yeah. Uh, you're not necessarily initially worried about whether the New York Times is going to come and review your side right. project, uh, and so it's untethered. It is. It allows for uh, I know something that I sort of like to call deep play. Um, it's a element of whimsy or something, and, and I think there's something actually really essential about uh, interesting art making that is uh, tied up in that sort of, uh, this, that allows for that. I mean, at some point you need sort of critique and you do need rigor and you need to push and challenge and shape. But I think there's this, this place in, a, in an idea or a project's evolution where if the, the, the space of side project feels really, um, yeah. Well, and when ideas are so new, like the, the pressure, like, oh, this needs to make money, or this, like, has to, yeah. like, something has to come out of this really quick. You can sort of, like, snuff that out so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but, like you're saying, when it's on the side, it, it has that sort of chance to take root. Yeah, there's a, yeah, anyway, there's, a, there's an opportunity for a different kind of play, a different kind of investigation mm -hmm. that to me feels really liberating and fun, and we should nurture that. And I also, another thing you talked about is, I mean, it's, uh, I do so many, most artists I know are working other jobs to pay the bills. Certainly in Austin, that is mm -hmm. uh, by and large the norm, that is the reality that most people are, are faced with. And also, I would also say that just the lines between our sort of work lives and our artistic lives and home lives, it's, at least for me, it's very blurry, it's very, murky uh, and I also think that like artistic practice is often a practice it is also a discipline and so I mm -hmm. this is very uh, I could see how this would actually be super helpful and useful I certainly think about writing mm -hmm. uh, to me writing is, uh, is is that it's a discipline it's that's not sitting around waiting for inspiration it's actually sitting down and doing the work and the writing reveals more rewriting writing reveals writing mm -hmm. and, and having something uh, that is a visual reminder of prompts to sort of encourage uh, a sort of a, a discipline in your crafts feels really useful to me um, and it's a beautiful design it's really, cool. really lovely yeah I think that 
that was also I think a, an important component that I didn't really touch on is like it has to be something you you would want to show and like be okay with being in your space and yeah. so uh, I think that was that's definitely part of it. Well, those were things. Those were two big things that really resonated with me: the the love and the wanting to nurture side projects yeah. as a thing, uh, but also just this this at least in my own life uh, uh, recognition of the how blurry my personal life and my money gigs and jobs are and my art it's like it's one it's very blurry and those the walls between those things are very porous and open and it's nice to be able to like sort of create a few sort of <laughs> uh, some boundaries or structures within that it mm -hmm. seems really helpful yeah. I have a question so I think I mean I'm really fascinated by uh, the intersection of technology and art a lot of the yeah. potential of that. I think, especially as side projects go, for a lot of people, there's probably a, that technical hurdle. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I'm kind of curious to hear if you had any of those technical hurdles. And oh, so I mean, there's question. there's obviously the electronics side to that. There's also the CNC and like getting the actual encasing of your yeah. design. So I'm curious to hear about that. Um, I, I it's a great insight. I think for me. I, so I did an undergrad, my undergrad was industrial design, mm -hmm. and very quickly kind of got more into software and development. Um, so I think I did have some some bit of the skills, probably electronics is like, I'm most like hacking it together. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have realized that I can learn new things when I'm really excited to, to pull something off. And for me, it was like having this vision and just kind of like, I'll, I'll figure out what it takes to do that. Or I can find the people who are, will spend the, some time to help me. So um, I think the most challenging thing for me has been just the context switching, like you're saying, of like designing a beautiful case, like trying to mill that out in the shop in Sandy Town, and then like writing the code to make sure that it's working. And then like, also there's an app component and like there's an API involved and like, so and those are like very, they're very different activities, um, and trying to find the right balance of like, it, and it feels like juggling. It's like wait, you know, like this one is terrible. Like these are okay. Like I can need to like spend some more time here. So I'd say that, that was probably the the most difficult challenge was trying to figure out, and failing sometimes to spend the most time on, on the part that needed it the most. And was that primarily you doing all of that work? Or yeah. So it actually, it actually kind of started as an idea between me and my wife, and then I took it to Fractured Atlas, and I was like, hey, we want to support artists, like, this, is an, this yeah. could be an interesting way, and sort of got some time to go with it, but I'm, uh, it's, it's mostly me there, and I have some coworkers who have been helping yeah. with sort of the marketing and, and the other side, but the product side has been mostly me so far. I also love the, uh, just jumping around a little bit, but I love your sort of analogy to like a Fitbit and the, the sort of the fitness sort of yeah. is really kind of a craze at this point. <laughs> right. uh, my partner of eight years does it religiously, if you know, which is not, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it's nice to feel like there's a sort of uh, related kind of monitoring and encouragement and yeah. feedback system that also has a different sort of tenor to it. Absolutely. Um, I think, and I, it's funny because I'm so careful. I. I'm still figuring out what words resonate because I think, you know, like tracking your time it sounds so businessy, and I think a lot of artists like wouldn't relate to that. So we talk about like, oh, recording your creative rhythm, or like, and I like sometimes that just makes it more difficult to understand. But I, I also believe like this is it's not a job. This is your side project yeah. and something you love, and like, uh, so yeah, I like walking that balance between being uh, super. I don't know, just find, finding the language that's appropriate yeah. for this personal thing. Yeah. And maybe you can have like a guilt dial. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guilt can be very effective for certain people. You know? <laughs> so that's true. You can sort of set the, the parameters. Get to work, fatty. <laughs> <laughs> you lazy asshole. <laughs> Do something with your life. <laughs> yeah. Have you gotten any insights from using that over time? I mean, because it is essentially very much like quantified self, right? Yeah. 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 
I think maybe that it's it's not nearly as consistent, mm -hmm. and, and I think maybe that's that's obvious, but. Um, for me, it really comes in waves, uh, and, and when I'm able to spend time on side projects, and I'll go, you know, hard for like a weekend, and then maybe not touch something for a month, and then come back, and so I think that I'm not sure exactly like what how to make sense of that yet, but um, that has been surprising to me. Is um, is the inspiration for this uh, come from? behavior you were doing already? Were you already trying to structure your side projects like this? Or was this like aspirational, you wanted to start doing this? Yeah, it's probably more aspirational for me. Uh, um, when we started, my wife was really spending eight hours a day on her artwork. Um, and so it, it, it almost was like more built for her to begin with. Um, and to keep her on track or to? Yeah, well, so the original, the, there's sort of like a buried history here, but the, the original thing was like this timer box. And at the time, she had some people who was helping her with her work, mm -hmm. and she was like, I really need to understand how long each of these steps take. So I like built her this thing, and, it, and actually That's through that process, working with her, I realized that like this is so specific for you, I actually think most people don't have this amount of time to spend on their work. So that's where I kind of backed out to this idea where it's less for like the full-time artist and more for the part-time. And so that, and that's where I think it started to resonate more with me as someone who's like, I want to spend more time on these things, but I just don't, like, I'm just not doing it right now. And like, I love these things, I believe in them, but like, why aren't, why aren't I taking the time? Um, I don't know if that's more confusing, but that's, that's a little bit more how it came out. Also, I want to know um, what you thought was like the single biggest iteration that you did. What was the biggest change you got from I think I think it was that for like that first version of like, oh, it's not it's not really about time. It's not like I spent you know fifteen point two minutes yesterday. Um, it's really about motivation mm -hmm. and moving away from the digital display that it was so um, you know numeric and metric and moving to something softer and more abstract. And I think that gives you a better at a glance view of, of where you're headed. I feel like there's so much less guilt involved than like when you look at your GitHub, you know? It's right. so nice that it resets. Yeah, you know. absolutely. What's the, what's the full name of it? Make Time Clock? Oh. I have some cards uh, at the website. Half of them are beer flavored. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I have Scratch and <laughs> I'm just wondering if, um, if linguistically, like um, calling it a clock, and how that matches up with kind of your decision to move away from the concept of time. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I don't know. I think it was uh, for me. I think the the when I read it on the meetup, right? Like I think. Uh, the mental model I created was of something numeric. So yeah. I think that there is a you know a delight and a surprise, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I would be. It doesn't bother me yeah. any. But from the feedback that you got, that people were kind of you know, you know, quantified sets blocks of time a yeah. verse. That seems interesting. Yeah, I I definitely have thought about the name a lot. Um, Part, part of it is like a play on words, you're making time. Mm -hmm. um, it's also like a time clock that like you would punch in. Right. Um, <laughs> the, the, my favorite feedback is that uh, my, my friend was like, it sounds Japanese, like he had just come back from <laughs> Japan. And he was like, they just put two, like three English words together. He's like, he like, don't get me wrong, I like it. <laughs> it sounds like it was translated Japanese and back. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, and actually, the original version was was uh, was part time clock, um, but we moved away from that. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> oh, I think there was this feeling that like, what was it? I don't even remember. So I really love the name. I think it's great. Okay. Oh, yeah.
to the domain was available. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. It's, it's like this little box actually pr produces time for you. Like right. It makes time for you. It's right. Nice. Yeah. Wonders of technology. <laughs> um, that's very cool. Cool. Yeah. And so, when is it ready for the masses? Yeah. So we're so our goal is to sell two hundred fifty clocks, um, and that our campaign ends November fourth. Um, or 60% there. So it kind of depends on how things end up. Um, right now we're delivering, I think, in the spring, most of our rewards are uh, cool. in the spring. So Is there uh, a way to sort of connect people that are using them? I mean, is that, is that like part of the plan? I mean, if you wanted to, you could kind of, there's like this kind of inherent community. Yeah, there's... there definitely is, and it's something I've thought about. I, mm -hmm. I sort of consciously decided that to like push that off for yeah. version one. And to really focus on the individual, yeah. uh, but I think there's, a, I definitely think there's a lot of potential there. It'd be cool. Is the uh, is the arrangement of the lights purely uh, aesthetic, or is it supposed to be functional in terms of like reaching mm -hmm. a goal? Is, it, is there a metaphor built into that? So w I think it's supposed to be open ended, okay. and I think for some people, this is actually an older prototype when we had ten lights. The Production one that we're going with has six. Um, so I think some people, I think filling that up every week is gonna be very satisfying. You can actually go over and it'll just sort of like start over again and in a slightly different color so you can keep going past six. Um, so I think for some people it's like, I wanna, you know, six, six sessions at 30 minutes, that'd be like three hours a week on my project, right? That's what they want. I think there are other people who just want to record this time that they're spending and our, my friend who's a photographer was talking about like I'm an artist in a small town and like you know I feel like I'm wasting my time or, like people don't say this but like just get this feeling that you're like what what do you do like you're not making money like I don't understand and for her it was like just having this thing like I'm like I this time is valued because I'm I'm recording it and so for her it was less about six but she would go beyond six um, so th that's that's kind of the idea. Is like it's, it could be either way. And, um, okay. Is the uh, is this thirty minute? Um, is that a hard like? Is that programmable? Yeah, is yeah. Settable by yeah. User? So that's just the default that we're starting with. But in okay. the in the app, you can change that. That's cool. Uh, okay. Awesome questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, whenever you first started doing like your user research. Um, I guess you kind of already had like a defined population in mind, but how did you reach out to them? Did you use like the Craigslist post or did you go to some like place that had a bunch of artists already or like how, how did you gather your user base? To, to uh, I, it was mostly personal connections and I think it's partly going to art school and being in that community, but um, also some of the testers, my first testers were people I knew here in town who like this person who's a screenwriter and does theater was dating a friend of mine, and so, so like, uh, for me it was just like sending an email, and like let's go have coffee, and I, my approach though was not like, I need 50 people, it was like, I just need like five, who are like really could spend time, we could talk, and I think that's, for me, I find that more inspiring to sort of go deep with a person and understand what they're going through, and then extrapolating out from that. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, we've got a little more time. If people are welcome to hang out. If, there, if people have projects or things that they're working on that they want to share, this is a good time to do that. Uh, if there are, uh, it can also be just something that you've seen recently, that floored you, that you really excited. Um, yeah, we've got plenty of time. No pressure. I was interested to know if you um, if you've heard of an organization called Future Everything out of the UK. Yeah. They do. It sounds like very similar. I worked with them on a project. Oh, awesome. Future yeah. Everything. Future Everything. Um, <laughs> they hold a festival in Manchester and Singapore. Awesome. And Moscow, where they invite digital artists to come do um, you know innovative you know type of work um, stuff with like lights and sound. It all started as like a 
it's an electronic musician festival, but it's kind of evolved into this, and now they're doing a bunch of stuff with open data and um, citizen sensing type of stuff, but it sounds very similar to what Fusebox is, so I don't know if you're familiar with And you're based in the UK? Yeah, in Manchester. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question to put to all of you that's kind of fun. So I was just at the, uh, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis uh, for a convening. They invited 20 curators from sort of the performing arts world and 20 curators in the visual art world um, to look at some common sort of issues. There's a lot of, a lot, uh, a lot of museums are, are increasingly uh, adding performance into their collections. Uh, Tate and MoMA are buying performance, and so there's a lot of questions, right? What does that even mean to own a performance, this ephemeral thing? Uh, and one of the, the, the topics that I thought was especially interesting was this question of archiving, um, which I also think is something that, is, that traditionally the visual art world has done much better than performing arts, uh, partially because the performing arts, theater, dance, performance are these ephemeral things. Uh, and they don't lend themselves to archiving quite as much. Um, but, um, so there was this, uh, the, guy, the head archivist from the Tate was there, he was talking about, they had just bought this, uh, this Joseph Boy's performance, and he was talking, and it was gonna be part of the Tate collection, and also how, now they were gonna build this archive around this Joseph Boy's performance, and so how do you do, how do you build a meaningful record of this thing that no longer exists, this, this moment in time? There's still photographs, there were some sketches, uh, and then there's all this other, like, ephemera, the stuff that, you know, and so you have to sort of, and so, like, he found this receipt for a microphone, and a lot of the photographs, Joseph Boy's is prominently sort of wielding this, this microphone, and then, he found these correspondences between boys and his collaborators about the microphone, and they were like debating it. They were like, this, uh, you know, this this piece was actually really about uh, democratizing this space with the audience. They felt like the microphone was going to sort of change the tenor of that space. Suddenly, it, the, the microphone was sort of this tyrannical uh, sort of thing. So, so when, it, when this like receipt for this microphone became this kind of window, this lever into this sort of really juicy uh, piece, uh, you know, philosophical debate at the heart of the project. So I thought it was really interesting just thinking about um, different strategies for archiving these uh, sort of ephemeral things. And then I started thinking also about festival as a thing, because I also think a festival to me is not it, to me, a festival is more than the sum of its parts. That it's clear to me how you could really thoroughly document each of the performances that are part of a festival through more robust video and writing and stills. But what about all the conversations uh, before and after? And what about the different threads between these things? And so how do you actually archive a festival in a way that's more meaningful? And when you think, like, what was the 2000... Well, Fusebox Festival, what was that? Well, it was all of these things, but it was also these conversations and these two projects that were next to each other that you would have never linked in your mind, but somehow they were actually really exciting uh, next to one another. Um, so then I started thinking about, well, what if there was some kind of gaming, if you were using some kind of gaming engine to create a sort of uh, home to navigate the sort of, uh, memories and impressions and uh, ephemera of each uh, festival edition that you could navigate through sort of what was this festival and you could experience video and writing and conversations and navigate through physical space. Um, that's as far as I've got, but I thought it's a juicy kind of idea, I think, to think about how do you, one, archive these ephemeral things in a, in a meaningful way in a way that, that someone other than maybe an academic scholar would actually want to kind of enter into and engage with. Um, that's, that's something that I'm thinking about. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that or 
strategies or people I should talk with, um, but, it, but it's also something that I know the field is really uh, wrestling with right now. Um, what are different approaches to it? To me, it also just like, I was thinking, especially in Austin, in this city that has three festivals every weekend, um, and maybe some of them you don't really need to archive, but uh, I don't know, I think it would be interesting to be able to to look look at what we're what's happening um, artistically uh, at these things. So. Yeah, um, I think it would be cool to analyze it uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. But I was thinking recently about how I don't like I get a lot out of watching live concerts yeah. so much so that I don't even like I basically just experience the concert. Like, it doesn't make me, like, I got the same experience just from watching a video um, that I pretty much would have gotten from going to the actual thing. So I was thinking, like, I would rather there just be no records on uh, these performances yeah. than yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's just bothering There's me. something sweet about living in the moment. Yeah. You know, and, you know, trying to sort of harness things, you know, put time in a bottle, so to speak, yeah. you know, sort of have something last forever. Yeah. I mean, that's why things are cool, is because they don't last forever. Yeah. You know, so I mean, the the desire to archive. I mean, I think there's sort of limits to that. You yeah. Know? It's like, to what degree do you want to, you know, keep the authenticity of the moment or whatever? Or is it just about having, you know, hints and clues that you can sort of talk about later? And this this is a great question. And so for me, I would say, absolutely. Like, there, it is to to try and really fully recreate the life experience is, is at least that, that's actually not so interesting to me mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm thinking about the, f the, f the art form and the field and people that are working in um, a live form um, that it is really hard to uh, study and engage with that form unless you are traveling to Buenos Aires and Berlin and New York constantly because these things are inherently live. And so I'm trying to figure out, I think that's something that has held back the performing arts for years um, because there's, there's, a, there's a really currently not a, a, an adequate way of actually engaging with uh, with the art form, unless you're experiencing it constantly. I think teenagers can watch a hologram of Michael Jackson. <laughs> no, just yeah. Uh, my cousin, she works for a startup in uh, San Francisco, mm. and their startup is called Pop Up Magazine, mm. and it's a uh, it's it's a based on you know what a magazine does has yeah. different pieces of content, and so they do a basically an, an, an event, a mini festival or a stage performance. Oh. Uh, yeah. I think um, I don't know a concert mixed with TED. Mm -hmm. um, and then these are these one night only events and they record nothing and then they move to a new city mm -hmm. and they do something relevant to that city. Um, they are taking, I guess, the opposite approach of archiving nothing to yeah. create this exclusivity. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about it, it seems like what you said was it's less about recreating the festival and it, I mean it seems more like a it would seem more like a history exhibition of something yeah. that is based in art. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go to any of like uh, these historical monuments, or you know, if you I've been to the you know the Anne Frank House, right? Yeah. So that is just filled with ephemera, and it's a tour of mm -hmm. um, of stuff, right? So that's supposed yeah. to give you that feeling of, of what it was like and and whatnot. And I don't know if looking at some of these types of uh, Things that are based in history and not in art yep. to try and create that environment is cool. like an interesting model. That's really cool. Yeah, I love that idea of like the, the special features of like you know it's like you're not watching the movie you're watching like the thing that it takes to get there. And like mm -hmm. I'm just imagining like what if you could pop out like the collaborators' email threads and mm -hmm. yeah, they're like texts and like show them on a timeline. And, like, uh, yeah, and it's like that that doesn't necessarily even have to do with the work that or it doesn't exactly describe the work that's going to take place, but it's like everything else with the microphone, that's a fascinating story. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's cool. What was the film that um, uh, Coppola's wife shot during uh, during Apocalypse Now? 
Oh, Heart of Darkness? Yeah. I mean, this so is, I mean, so it tells you yeah. so much about the film, totally, totally. and it's totally marginal. If you guys don't know about it, she documented the whole making of Apocalypse. Now, how long did that take? Like, three yeah. years or something? Yeah, more. Yeah. But, it's an amazing documentary. But the filmmaker's wife followed him around and made her own film, and it's maybe even more interesting <laughs> than the original. So good. And, it, and it's an incredible insight, yeah, you know. It really and it's it's you know obviously they're not like you know excerpts or scenes from the film. I mean, there's a little bit of that, but for the most part, it's you know Harvey Keitel actually played uh, Agent Kirk or whatever you know yeah, before yeah. he was replaced. You know, this it's it's interesting. Yeah. No, but it's interesting, um, also going back to this idea of non-documentation, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what the strategies are for that, I mean, is it about living in the moment, and is that really what matters, you know, more than, yeah, I don't know, having, you know, tools for nostalgia or something? That's a great, I think, I think these are great, great questions, I and mean, I do feel like, the, obviously, the, the, that liveness is in some ways the thing that is at the very heart of that art form. Uh, and so to try and replicate that, it does in some ways feel like you're, you're ripping the, the guts out of, of the very thing, why you would be doing that. I think I'm more thinking about it maybe, at least initially, it's just for the field, um, that, that how do you study the, the ideas that are in play um, if like most artists I know don't have the ability to be traveling to, like I said, Berlin and Buenos Aires all the time to be experiencing these things. And so what are some strategies that as a field we could employ to allow people to begin to, even if you don't really get the full experience of being in the room with this thing, you can start to, to have an interaction with the ideas that are being explored and that are, that are being explored in the live room. Um, and, I, and I love the idea of, of some of these these side sort of like email chains and receipts of these things that how can we kind of begin to to get at the 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 ideas that are in play in different way, ways that are kind of fun to encounter. Um, so I don't know. I think it's interesting maybe looking at um, what what it's like viewing the heart of darkness in the absence of seeing apocalypse now mm -hmm. and what is the relationship between viewing those things separately or together or one before the other. Yeah. I think that that's an interesting metaphor for what's yeah. happening here. Is it more important to go through this uh, this, uh, this this archive mm -hmm. um, for people that have been to the festival? Is this is like a, a supplementary mm -hmm. thing that you do also as well to get the full experience? Uh, yeah, um, that's a great question. And or what or what effect is it if you've missed the event and you yeah. see this? Um, I wonder if there's like significant differences in those users. So yeah, that was, that was great. I, was, I had almost been thinking of it as something for people that weren't there. Right. Uh, but I do think there's something that's actually really nice to think about this other sort of set of users that were there. And this is yeah, a, I feel like if I went to the festival and then heard about this archive yeah. that it had a lot of other content yeah. that I had never seen and I really enjoyed the festival, yeah. it'd be more that's awesome. awesome to well, go. It sounds like we're talking about something really old. It's just a catalog. Yeah. I mean, I, I see shows all the time mm -hmm. that I, I don't get to visit. Yeah, but I get to read about it. I get to see images of it. I mean, I'm not there physically, of course, but I can still yeah. engage with all the ideas. Uh, you know, from multiple perspectives. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty rich experience. You know, that's why art books are so cool. You know, um, I don't know. Do you guys have document like you, you publish catalogs for the? Well, we have a we have a festival guide yeah. uh, with writing and and a, normally a, a single image for each project. But I, I mean, it's something that we have talked about is, is inviting more uh, writers, uh, and making that more of an actual sort of thing and that is, you know, a book, an object uh, that's more robust. Um, I remember reading about uh, uh, John Baldessari in California in the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, just growing up looking at art books, mm -hmm. and that was his experience with everything. Yeah. Then he finally got to Europe and he was terribly disappointed <laughs> looking at the originals. So he just went back to like, you know, focusing on the reproductions. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's good. So, uh, you know, there's something to be said for that, you know, once removed experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was a, like a teenager, 
I played my first show before I even went to my first show. Wow. You know, That's amazing. Where it was like just the weirdest stuff because it was yeah. like a couple kids that like never been to a concert. We've seen like Jimi Hendrix videos and stuff. Wow. But like, so we're just like, <laughs> what, what the hell do we show, do? Dude. They're just like, really you know, like rock and roll is fun. So we're yeah. like, make something weird out of it. And, and like, <laughs> That's what happens, right? It's like in a garage, and yeah. there's a couple kids, and they're all just like, mm. like it's all like everyone's on top of each other and stuff. Yeah. Like, and the going back a little bit, I actually saw Heart of Darkness before I saw Apocalypse Now because ah. um, I saw it in school, and it was about because I needed to know about the music beforehand because mm. um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on like the music being this travel back in time, and um, so for me, I mean, seeing that movie before, it's kind of interesting to have like that. Like, what if you saw all the documentation that was going on for a festival before the festival? Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, the reverse of, like, oh, let's document it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if you see everything beforehand? You know, like, yeah. all this crazy crap that's going on to get it going. Like, I don't know, like, we volunteered at Fantastic Fest a couple weeks ago, and it's like, what if you know that going in all the crazy shit that's going on, like, before? So people trying to tighten stuff, what, stick stuff up. If you find out that the final party got changed its location and stuff, like while you're happening, you're experiencing like while everything's happening. Um, and also it'd be interesting if there's like an art form that you can't study, yeah. you know, yeah, like yeah. with, like if you can't archive it, then everyone has to make something up, you know. That's fun. There's some conceptual arts like that too, like, I don't know, like Kawara's like I Got Up series of postcards, yeah. that's yeah. not the art, the postcard is not the art, it's the act of it. That's, mm-hmm. And I guess you, the fact that the postcards have become the art, not the intent. I don't know, that's just kind of what it's making me Yeah, that's a classic problem with a lot of this kind of work. It's mm-hmm. like, um, yeah. is the work the document, or is it what it's documenting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a good question. Mm. It's, you know, that's, I mean, when I see, like, a large-scale photograph of, of a performance, that always really, like, upsets me. Mm. <laughs> because if it's a document, it's a document. I mean, it has a particular scale, you know, 8 by 10 max, you know. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you know, it should be in a book, but when you see something like you know, at a painterly scale, and it's, you know, essentially a document, then, mm. I don't know, there's just something that's fundamentally misunderstood, I think, about, uh, you know, the nature of that record. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, there are other performance artists, uh, have you guys heard of this guy, Timo Segal? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's just absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently, uh, you cannot photograph any of his performances. There is no documentation. Yeah. Um, even when he, because he does sell his performances. Yeah, yeah. But apparently there's no receipt. <laughs> <laughs> there's no invoice, there's no receipt, there's no, uh, there's nothing. Mm. You know, so I think he's sort of challenging even like the notion of like the commodification. Of yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but then in the end, so, I mean, what is it ultimately? I guess the money's real. <laughs> you know, um, be interesting if you refuse that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I, mean, if, I think if you take that to the extreme, there's a, a critical theorist uh, named Bakhtin back in the early 20th century. He wrote a piece called The Death of the Author, and the idea behind it is that the moment that the author has written a text and someone else is reading it, they're reauthoring the text in the process uh, of reading it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a, I mean, that's a very pessimistic view <laughs> where you, whatever your idea is yeah. futile the moment somebody else is interpreting it. But, I think that that it's good to see that extreme when we're talking about archiving. Yeah. Um, I think the other side of that spectrum is um, it, it ultimately comes down to what the end goal was for the artists or yeah. what they're trying to communicate. Because, I mean, ultimately, somebody viewing their artwork in the museum might not convey the full idea, you know, to some individual, but somebody else reading about it might get more out of it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. So I think that value judgment is very much based on whatever the the intent is of the author or the artist. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, this is super helpful. Sharp cookies. Hey there. Would you like some pizza or beer? <laughs> so much. Um, well, maybe lastly, just before we go, I'd love to, um, what, if anyone has ideas for other speakers, let me know. Um, but I'd also like to, I'm feeling like, we actually have, we have close to 400 people, uh, at least that are signed up for this meetup group. And I'd love to, to uh, at some point, figure out some 
things sort of created for us to sort of do uh, together. Uh, maybe it's an event, maybe it's a platform of some kind, uh, but I think there is, I don't know, it looks like it'd be fun. Uh, maybe it's some kind of hackathon, maybe it's not, I don't know. I think it could take any number of shapes. Uh, but I just feel like uh, that would be a fun wrinkle to throw into uh, the mix and give us something to kind of work towards. So if, the, if, uh, if you have a, do you have an idea? Or a uh, maybe, but I want to ask, how did you get 400 people involved with this group? <laughs> we started to meet up. Yeah. Like, the, 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 like, we haven't done anything, really. They're always here, right? Yeah, they're always here. Um, yeah, that calls, man. In fact, I mean, we, we, sh we, could, we, we should be doing more. It's just like, we just haven't really done anything. We started it, uh, and, you know, there's like 385 people or something. And, um, I mean, you know, it fluctuates month to month sometimes. Last month, I think we had the room was full. This yeah, the month room was like huh? we pulled two thousand stack back there. Um, but it's fun to, for me to think about kind of just trying to do something together. So, um, if you have any thoughts or inspirations, uh, post it on the on Meetup. You can send me an email, however you prefer. Uh, What's your email? Ron, R O N at fuseboxfestival.com, F-U-S-E-B-O-X festival.com. Um, so yeah, send me ideas, inspiration for a big thing we could all kind of work on together, um, and or if there's other speakers or projects or either uh, locally or nationally that, that you think would be nice, uh, or some kind of workshop. Um, that would be exciting if there's someone that you think is especially interesting and good at uh, teaching or would be good at doing some kind of class or workshop. That could be really fun for us to do as well. Um, and also feel free to share, use the meetup to share projects or events that you're working on. That's all I've got. Hey, thank you. Feel free to take pizza with you, stuff in your shirt. Oh really? Oh whoa, dude. That's a huge yeah. brand. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
about six months, quite six months. Uh, this is a startup called on Steam. I don't know how much you have in stock, though. I don't think I heard Yeah, it was, uh, well, it still is, but I left it. Um, it's an anonymous social media app for college sites. So, I don't know if you really agree with that. Yeah, I haven't wrapped my head around yeah, the so actual. So, there's a couple of these. Um, the value is a blockchain and digital rights. I know that a company called Music and Tower School in London is about Instagram. Uh, launched here for a decentralized music sharing profile and identify by. So the idea is to so kind of open up the space where you can share some of our own. It's like, I mean, it's like um, they've just launched a product. But obviously, they don't have a lot of the song issues that are on the Spotify program. They take a lot of that. So when you download it, uh, oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, when you download it, you then you're you're for your money, your Bitcoin, whatever. It's automatically distributed to everybody that works on that software. And then you, um, but I was just wondering, I mean, it, it, it seems like in, in digital art, like I, since it's already digital by nature, like I don't care if the one that I have on my computer is the authentic one or a reproduction. Like, right? they're, they're, they're like, so I just um, see them like watching and trying to combat this. I don't see I can't tell if that's what they're trying to do. I don't see how the combat's are. Look, I think they are trying to do an artist page. Here's the basic project. So they tell me about some sort of video. I mean, I don't know if it's been in over here. Oh, give us your material. It's free. Don't so worry about the economics, it's free, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a whole group or a lot of people who are over by about, about a million, actually. Yeah. 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 I think it was a French thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. and the bunch of artists that we're talking to, like, yeah. they totally yeah. good. Uh, they were like, you know, we're so we're providing this content that has a real value, I think. And, you know, yeah. we're like, basically just starting as a new agent to go to like, you know, so I think it comes down to this, just like getting pure economic trust in high school and uh, uh, even if the nature of the work is by definition becoming more and more uh, ephemeral and immaterial, it's, uh, it, it's, it's complicated, you know. Um, I think that uh, iTunes saves the music industry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of right. the idea that the artist can actually have this career, that's what he's doing. Um, it's still in the works. Yeah, they're, they've been working on assets um, and trying to get. So remember at the time I was talking about musicians saying that the only way that they can earn a living now is by playing live shows. Oh, right, right. I also do music, so yeah. So you know all about it. Yeah, yeah. This is what I was looking up for you. I was just looking at the page. Um, this is the book that I just, I mean, it just came out like okay. a month ago. Anyways, but but I talked about a lot of this stuff in here. Okay. Um, it's on, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we didn't really, yeah, we didn't post our ball the, uh, the time there. But, um, but it, you know, it also talks about all of this stuff. I know Josh pretty well. So, but I'm uh, well, I'm increasingly convinced that uh, maybe doing somewhere else we could make a lot of time to be down here. It's sort of uh, consumed and it's not really like every nice to be yeah. place. You know, but it's important for artists that there be some sort of very good model. Oh, this is you should have gone. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's like it's some space. Artists maybe built more room. Oh, I've been to a kind of in their background. Oh, yeah, it reminds me of something. There's something that. Uh, the Wu Tang Clan. Uh, oh, the, the record. The record, right? One record, right? So one, they produced one record yeah. and it tours in a museum. And then to listen, you get an hour, you sign up, and schedule time for an hour to go into a room with some really nice headphones and everything. And listen to it with guards outside the door. And you have to like, leave your cell phone and everything. And it's, it's a gold record, though. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the gold record. Yeah. So it's like this uh, trying to bring this scarcity. Yeah, it's forced scarcity back to that music. Yeah, so I worked in there. Oh, well, thanks very much for coming. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the last record for the Grammy, right? The previous one, he never recorded He just made a song. He wrote the songs, he did the partition for it, and he published the 
videos, and I think you're really? really? yeah. Oh, yeah. So he never recorded anything from them. He uh, played some of them live. So there was a whole community of uh, They put videos on YouTube and every night. Then it goes back to the ad, you know, the, the pure documentation of yeah, more than married. Cool. Well, we could be like going for weeks.
Jenny reached out to you after. Yeah. Oh, took me forever. Cool. Um, yeah, we're actually talking to some UX candidates in Alabama. They say this is not those on top. desk of the hotel, the front desk of the hotel, but what do you think to talk to them? We can put up a note for them, but when are they going to realize it? Because that's their car keys, right?
Hey, Jeff, this is Ron. Hey, uh, you left that half of your keys uh, by the ice chest, so I'm going to just leave them at the front desk oh, here on the 16th floor yeah. at Capital Factory. Uh, okay. Cool. understand where they're coming from, but yeah, I mean, I yeah, I agree. They're not they're not the greatest looking things, but. We should look at doing hydraulics, because um, ratcheting is like kind of fucked. Well, why? So he doesn't. He doesn't believe in stand-up desks. It just like it just dawns on me how how brutal that is and the whole situation is with the Wi-Fi too. Because I'm over here at Capital Factory and it's just like night and day. I was trying to upload something for John today, and I tried two different times, and it like took 30 minutes. And over here at Capital Factory, it took 45 seconds. It's like. about that is that I um, you know I was I was hearing date like 30 days they said 90 days I freaked out they said 30 days and as soon as I handed it over to preacher like it, it all of a sudden it's like June and then, and then whenever I ask preacher about it they get all pissed off and they're like we're handling this and it's like all right like I'm gonna stop like looking into this and the, the, they're just like they don't they, they don't care because they've got deadlines for customers and and so it's just like, oh, we found yet. So uh, they have, they have the, 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 that that uh, meet up, that uh, co-working space um, uh, on um, uh, what is it? Um, no, the co-working space yeah, on South Coast, uh, Fiber Co. They don't even have fiber. But yeah, because they, because. I mean, I've heard people have, they have like the fiber coming up to their house and Google still hasn't like been able to turn it on. Yeah. 
So, anything else going on? sure that she's handling the um, uh, she's handling the um, what you call it um, the um, the interviews and she's gonna just give them a, um, a survey rather than not a survey but a questionnaire um, and so you know if that I think it'll um, it'll probably be fine um, Yeah, we're going over there on um, right after test bus, so we might have to cruise out a little soon. But. Yeah, I figured I'd bring it down. Yeah, we talked about it more, and he's. Got, I think he's even more comfortable now that I was able to frame some stuff. Cause I, I told him I was like, look, man, they're like. She, she's been around the stuff, done it a lot. You're gonna have an opportunity to learn from her. And, um, and not to mention the fact that like, someone's gonna have to be there to bring her down back down to earth because she's gonna be like running like out and doing, trying to do crazy stuff. And we, and, and we, have, to, we have to keep it um, in line with, with your business priorities and, and reality. And you have to be, you have to be the, the, uh, the glue between development and um, and design and the business and so I think he once he start I think he really got that and he said also he spent some time thinking about it more and he realized the thing that was really like uh, making him most uncomfortable is just like PTSD from 1323 you know um, and, and thinking that like it'll it'll be um, that someone else being there could potentially cause those same kind of problems but you know, but then he came to realize that it's just like fear, uncertainty, and doubt, not reality that's driving those thoughts. He seems, I mean, he really resonated with it, and I think he's starting to warm up to it. So I think Friday we'll, um, we'll take, we'll see where things go. Yeah, so we're going to do a breakfast session, and then we're going to do a, uh, uh, gosh, what is it? Um, um, We're gonna do like a design session, so it's gonna be me, uh, John, and Tony, kind of just uh, kind of going going at the whiteboard. And I think the thought is, and I want to Chris, uh, sorry, um, John's gonna kind of sleep on it a bit, but we're kind of throwing around the idea of doing a, um, like a uh, one of these internal tools because it would kind of take some of the emotion out of it because we've been we've been having a lot of talks around what we love to do and. and what we think the customer should be about, but like the uh, some of the some of the more internal tooling um, and the non-consumer stuff is not going to be as touchy, and as and not, there won't be as many emotions around it, and so we could really just get to a collaboration exercise rather than like you know. So we'll see. I um, I, I do think it would be a, it could be interesting to go either way, but um, so you know we'll we'll figure that out before she comes in.
So John and I blocked an entire day off on Tuesday just to prep for that. So, like, um, well, I'm not, so, you know, just let me know when, when, when it's like I blocked off 11 to 7.30, so.
Yeah, I, re I thought, did I not reply at all? I replied. I told her that a we were gonna pick that we're gonna pick them up on Friday. I told him we were gonna pick them up on Thursday, but we have that event on Thursday, and I gave him another so I can call him. And if they're not ready, I can give them shit, and then they'll you know they'll have an extra day. So then we'll pick them up on Friday. Um, so we'll someone will go on Friday and get them, unless someone's free on Thursday and can go get them. So we already have them. That's great. But like I didn't want to commit to doing it the same day as our event, and then. Um, yeah, and then uh, then the other point was uh, I told her that we would not be um, handling the transactions, and um, and then as far as the, the payment, I don't. I told her I needed to check with you and decide what we wanted to do. Um, Five originals and five prints, right? Yeah. Well, it's twenty. One hundred twenty-five prints plus, 20, so it's one hundred fifty transactions. Well, I can tell you how much the uh, the so the originals are uh, eighty five dollars each, and the the, sh the papers were twelve dollars each. So, um, wait, wait twenty five sheets. So oh wait, twelve plus eighty five. So the and then the, I would say the, I would say the scan should go into the cost of the original. So it's 80, 85 plus twelve plus fifty. Well, it's actually one forty seven. So should we do one fifty? Okay. That's uh, six grand. Two hundred on a renewal. So that's that's four grand there. Yeah, awesome. So two hundred and fifty. All right, cool. I'll email her now. Come on. All right.
where you at? Cool. Hey, uh, so that thing, I got it hosted, but the URL is all kind of fucked up because I can't uh, reverse proxy like I thought I would be able to because CloudFront like, just doesn't deal well with that apparently. So, um, our best bet is to come up with a subdomain um, like um, support dot twila.co or sales dot twila.co or info dot twila.co um, or we could do homeowners dot twila.co homeowners dot twila.co why is that that's blue right yeah that's the only way to get get decent trying to get this shit working. All right, I'm gonna do this a different way. All right, I'll check you later. Yeah. All right, cool. Right on. Yep,
Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to get some shit fixed.